let's return back to the question of how many alien civilizations are out there and uh, talk about the Drake equation. Yeah. Can you uh, explain the Drake equation? You know, people have various uh, feelings about the Drake equation. Uh, it, you know, it can be abused, but basically it was the, the story actually is really interesting. So Frank Drake mm -hmm. in uh, 1960 does the first ever astrobiological experiment. He gets a radio telescope, points it at a couple of stars and listens for signals. That was the first time anybody done any experiment about any kind of life in the history of humanity. Um, and he does it and he's kind of waiting for everybody to make fun of him. Instead, he gets a phone call from the government says, hey, we want you to have, do a, um, a meeting on interstellar communications, right? So he's like, okay. So they organize a meeting with like just eight people. A young Carl Sagan is going to be there as well. Uh, and like the night before, Drake has to come up with a uh, uh, an agenda. How do you come up for an with a, an agenda for a meeting on a topic that no one's ever talked about before, yeah. right? And so he actually right, he breaks what he does. What's so brilliant about the Drake equation is he breaks the problem of how many civilizations are there out there into a bunch of sub problems, right? And he breaks it into seven sub problems. Each one of them is a factor in an equation that when you multiply them all together, you get the number of civilizations out there that we could communicate with. So the first term is the rate at which stars form. The second term is the fraction of those stars that have planets, F sub P. The next term is the number of planets in the habitable zone, the place where we think life could form. Uh, the next term after that is the fraction of those planets where actually an abiogenesis event, life forms, occurs. The next one is the fraction of planets on which you start to get intelligence. After that, it's the fraction of planets where that intelligence goes on to create a civilization. And then finally, the last term, which is the one that we really care about, is the lifetime. How long? You have a civilization. Now, how long does it last? Well, you say we we humans. We humans, right? Because we're standing, we're staring at the, you know, multiple guns pointing at yeah. us. You know, nuclear war, climate change, AI. Um, so, you know, how long on, in general does civilizations last? Now, each one of these terms, what was brilliant about what he did was, what he was doing was he was quantifying our ignorance, right? By breaking the problem up into these seven sub-problems, he gave astronomers something to do. Right. And so, you know, this is always with a new research field. You need a research program or else you just have a bunch of vague questions. You don't even know really what you're trying to do. Um, so, you know, the star people could figure out how many stars were forming per year. The, the people who were interested in planets could go out and find techniques to discover planets, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, these are their own fields. Essentially, by creating this equation, he's launching new fields. Yeah, that's exactly. He gave astrobiology, which wasn't even a term then. A roadmap, mm -hmm. like, okay, you guys go do this, you go do that, you go do that. And it had such far reaching effect on astrobiology because it did break the problem up in a way that gave useful, uh, uh, you know, sort of marching orders mm -hmm. for all these different groups. Like, for example, it's because of the Drake equation in some sense that um, people who were involved in SETI pushed NASA to develop the technologies for planet hunting. There was this amazing meeting in 1978, 19, two meetings, 1978 and 1979, that were driven in some part by the people who were involved in SETI getting NASA together to say, look, okay, look, how, you know, what's, what's the roadmap for us to develop technologies to find, find planets? So, um, yeah, so, you know, the Drake equation is absolutely uh, 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 foundational for astrobiology, but we should remember that it's not a law of nature right? It's not something that's, it's not e equals MC squared. And so you can see it being abused in some sense. People, you know, it's generated a trillion papers. Some of those papers are good. I've written some of those and some of those papers are bad. Um, you know, I'm not sure where my paper fits in on those. But I'm saying, you know, one should be careful about what you're using it for. But in terms of understanding the problem that, uh, that astrobiology faces, this really broke it up in a useful way. We could talk about each one of these, but let, let's just look at Excel planets. Yeah. So that's a really interesting one. I think when you look back, you know, hundreds of years from now, what is it, in the 90s when they first detected 90, the yeah, first? 92 and 95. 95 to me was really, that was the discovery of the first planet orbiting a sun-like star. To me, that was the water, the dam being broken. I, I think that's like one of the greatest discoveries in the, in the history of science. I agree. I agree. Right now, I guess nobody's celebrating it too much because you don't know what it really means. But I think once we almost certainly will find life out there, it will obviously allow us to generalize across 
the entire galaxy, the entire universe. So if you can find life on a planet, even in the solar system, you can now start generalizing across the entire universe. You can. All you need is one. Like right now, it's an any, you know, our understanding of life, we have one example. We have N equals one example of life. So that means we could be an accident, right? It could be that we're the only place in the entire universe where this weird thing called life has occurred. Get one more example, and now you're done. Because if you have one more example, now you're, you know, even, you know, you don't have to find all the other examples. You just know that it's happened more than once. And now you are, you know, in, from a Bayesian perspective, you can start thinking like, yeah, yeah, this is, life is not something that's hard to make. Well, let me get your sense of uh, estimates for the Drake equation. You have also written a paper expanding on the Drake equation, but what, what do you think, what do you think is the answer? So the paper, there was this paper we wrote, uh, Woody Sullivan and I, in 2016, where we said, look, we have all this exoplanet data now, right? The, so the thing that exoplanet science and the exoplanet census I was talking about before have nailed is F sub P, the fraction of stars that have planets, it's one. Every freaking star that you see in the sky hosts a family of worlds. I mean, it's mind boggling because every one of those, those are all places, right? They're either you know, gas giants, probably with moons. So there's the moons are places you can stand and look out. Or they're like terrestrial worlds where even if there's not life, there's still snow falling and there's oceans washing up on, you know, on shorelines. It's incredible to think how many places and stories there are out there. So, right, the first term was F sub P, which is how many stars have planets. The next term is how many planets are in the habitable zone, right, on average. And it turns out to be one over five. Right. So, you know, you know, around 0.2. So that means you just count five of them, go out at night and go one, two, three, four, five. One of them has an, an earth like planet, you know, in the habitable zone, like, whoa. So what, what defines a habitable zone? Habitable zone is an idea, um, that was developed in the, um, uh, 1958 by the Chinese American astronomer Xu Sheng. And it was, it was a brilliant idea. It said, look, this is there, you know, I can do this simple calculation. If I take a planet and just stick it at some distance from a star of what's the temperature of the planet, what's the temperature of the surface. So now you're all, you're going to ask, you give it a standard kind of, you know, earth-like atmosphere and ask, could there be liquid water on the surface? Right. We believe that liquid water is really important for life. There could be other things that's happening fine, but you know, if you were to start off trying to make life, you'd probably choose water as your solvent for it. So basically the habitable zone is the band of orbits around a star where you can have liquid water on the surface. You could take a you know glass of water, pour it on the surface and it would just pool up. It wouldn't freeze immediately, which would happen if your planet is too far out and it wouldn't just boil away if your planet's too close in. So that's the formal definition of the habitable zone. So it's a nice strict definition. There's probably way more going on than that, but this is a place to start. Right. Well, we should say it's a place to start. I, I do think it's too strict of a constraint. I would agree. We're talking about <laughs> temperature where water can be on the surface. There, there's so many other ways to get uh, the aforementioned turmoil yeah. where the temperature varies, whether it's volcanic, uh, so interaction of volcanoes and ice and all of this on the moons of plants that are much farther away, all yeah. this kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, for example, we know in our own solar system, we have, say, Europa, the moon of Jupiter, which has got a hundred mile deep ocean under 10 miles of ice, right? That's not in the habitable zone. That is outside the habitable zone. And that may be the best place. It's got more water than earth does. All of its oceans are, you know, it's twice as much water on Europa than there is on earth. So, you know, that may be a really great place for life to form and it's outside the habitable zone. So, you know, the habitable zone is a good place to start and it helps us. And there's reason, there's reasons why you do want to focus on the habitable zone because like Europa, I couldn't, I won't be able to see from across telescopic distances, across light years. I, I wouldn't be able to see life on Europa because it's under 10 miles of ice, right? So with the important thing about um, planets in the habitable zone is that we're thinking they have atmospheres. Um, atmospheres are the things we can characterize for across 10, 50 light years, and we can see biosignatures as we're going to talk about. So there is a reason why the habitable zone becomes important for the detection of extrasolar life. But for me, when I look up at the stars, it's very likely that there's a habitable planet or moon in each of the stars, habitable defined broadly. 
Yeah, I think that's that's not unreasonable to say. I mean, especially since the the formal definition, you get one in five, right? One in five is a lot. There's a lot of stars in the sky. So yeah, saying that in general, when I look at a star, there's a pretty good chance that there's something habitable orbiting it is not a unreasonable scientific claim.